So personalized medicine is on the EU political map. Um, the next days we'll have a European Commission conference. Um, EAPM has undertaken a series of interviews to get the stakeholders' perspective. Um, the European Alliance for Personalized Medicine is a multi-stakeholder platform bringing together patients, medical professionals, healthcare planners, industry, scientists and researchers. And to reflect this view, we have done these interviews to get the perspective both at EU level and the national level. This can be on the areas of big data, translation research, education of healthcare professionals and regulatory change. Professor Jan Eric Litton, um, Director of BBMRI. Eric, firstly, can you just describe what is BBMRI and Eric, and how does it contribute um, to healthcare at the European level? Actually, we'll start with Eric uh, because this is quite unique uh, because uh, BMRI is not a project, it's uh, uh, infrastructures. And uh, ERIC actually stands for e uh, European Research Infrastructure Consortium. And today we have about 12 ERICs in Europe, uh, most in physics. So what uh, uh, the member states and the commission want us to build is uh, an infrastructure for health. And BMRAG consists of two B, it's biobanks and biomolecular resources. So we've been working quite hard with the first B, the two first years, uh, and it's all about making a catalog of biobank samples in Europe and also increase the quality of samples. Uh, because that is extremely important now when we enter the era of personal medicine. Uh, because without high quality samples, no personal medicine in Europe. And are member states supporting this activity? Yes, uh, and we happen to be the, one of the biggest, Eric. We now have 20 member states uh, supporting us, uh, and also IARC, the cancer organization in Lyon. So we are the biggest, uh, Eric, in health, but also one of the uh, biggest, Eric, ever launched in Europe. And what were the challenges faced at the very beginning in setting up Eric? It's many challenges. Uh, one, of course, that very few heard about in Eric because that was uh, the Minister of Finance 2009 who decided to do this. And we still try struggle with that to explain what Eric is. And again, it's not a project, it's an infrastructure. Uh, secondly, because it's Europe, uh, we have uh, small countries like Malta that has one biobank and big countries like France, Germany, etc., that has hundreds and hundreds of biobanks. So this diversity uh, has... Uh, also, a lot of advantages because all those different biobanks, different populations is quite unique in Europe. So we can now create something that has never been done before on the global scales to get these biobanks data together to improve health for Europeans. And the EU data protection regulation was just revised. Um, will this have an impact on how ERIC will be managed and implemented both at the e EU level and also at the national level? Yeah. Actually, we had an impact on the regulation because we were working hard on to get it uh, right uh, because we were worried about the, the, what it could be at the end of the day. But uh, now we have a regulation that is okay. But now we will work with our lawyers uh, uh, on the European level to understand actually the text, what it means in practice. Uh, and that is work has just started and uh, uh, to, to help our member states to, to actually interpret uh, what, what the law actually means in practice. And going forward, how can EU um, Commission member states support ERIC more? Uh, I mean, they do it already because, as you know, the member states pay for us uh, and uh, also the interest for what we're doing is uh, increasing. So we have uh, at least three, four, five countries around the corners. Also outside Europe uh, is a lot of interest. So we've been invited to different uh, um, big countries. I was in uh, Japan in the, uh, just before Christmas, etc. So they want to know how we do this uh, on the European level. Mm. And patients are the new um, actor in town. They want to be more involved. Um, it's patient data that are, that's a key issue. How, how is Eric um, supporting this? Uh, this is really the key. Uh, and uh, finally, we managed to get m most of the important patient organization here in Europe under uh, the umbrella of Eric. So many things we'll be do for the years to come will be very much uh, focused on the patient and patient-driven. Extremely important. Alistair Kent, Director of Ge Genetic Alliance UK. I mean, e the EU has done a lot of work on the area of rare disease, um, and they saw this as an action, an area that they had to develop different activities. Um, how is it, this area developing, and, and what can Europe do more to support this, and how can member states support this action at the EU level? I think we're at a very exciting time for patients and families with rare diseases, because 
In recent years, we've seen huge advances in our scientific understanding. I mean, we're now at a position where we need, we, we can see the basic processes at a molecular level that go wrong that result in many rare life-limiting and lethal conditions. What we need to see now is sustained engagement with the process of capitalizing on that new knowledge, of bringing the opportunity uh, to generate insights into a mechanism for creating therapies that are available to all patients who need them uh, right across the European Union in an affordable and a sustainable way. Something that continues to attract the attention uh, of the uh, research-based pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries, that engages with the academic and clinical communities, and most importantly reflects the value and the, the hope that the possibility of an intervention brings to patients and families who otherwise live with the certainty of, of a life which is constrained in quantity and quantity and the risk of passing that uh, on to children uh, and, and further descendants. So the EU has um, created USERD, which, which brings together key stakeholders around this rare disease and also has created um, the Innovative Medicine Initiative. Uh, which brings together um, the public sector and private sector to develop these new types of treatments, new types of diagnostics, new types of collaboration. Is there any other mechanism um, that could facilitate and support these broad objectives that you set out there in developing new treatments, new and um, better quality of life for the patient? I think one of the most exciting things to come out of European level collaboration uh, in, in recent years has been the recognition of the cross-border, the transnational uh, input that's necessary if we're to make progress for rare diseases. The expert group on rare diseases at um, uh, the Commission has been responsible for stimulating the implementation of uh, expert reference networks across Europe. For rare diseases, this is a unique opportunity to bring together diverse expertise, to develop best practice, to generate the critical mass that will allow research, and to disseminate new knowledge across the whole of Europe in a prompt, uh, effective, and cost-effective way. Some of the research initiatives, like IMI, have again been important in terms of creating the opportunities for patients to have their voice in the R&D process. The, the UPATI program is a, is a case in point. Making sure that research attention, that industry's attention is, is focused on the issues that matter to patients and that research is carried out in a way which is addressing those things which are most important and which will bring about uh, the greatest opportunity for change. I think also the uh, advances in things like next generation sequencing, the fall of cost in, in, in analyzing genomes, the working together through uh, infrastructure collaborations like BBMRI help to bring a shared understanding a recognition of the critical mass and the opportunity to sift out those key events that occur, occur very rarely uh, in individual uh, nations, but when you take a, uh, a European perspective, become visible. They become like an iceberg in the hailstorm and you can see them and react to them and deal with them in a sensible and timely way. Eva Good from the National Genome Ana Analysis Center based in Barcelona. There's been many activities around personalized medicine. Um, there's a big conference tomorrow in the area of personalized medicine. What are the challenges um, that you see uh, going forward um, that the EU should tackle and member state, how member states can support this? Well, one of the biggest issues I see with, uh, with implementing personalized uh, medicine is the complexity of this. It really needs a rebuild of, a, of, a, of clinical uh, mechanisms. So things have to change dramatically, which means uh, you have to sort of adapt the, the systems the way they currently are to the new technologies, and you have to bring the clinicians to a point that they can deal with these new technologies because it, it, they are complex, they are difficult, and so on. So in a way, the, the, the problem underlying this is that you have to sort of take something that's very, very complicated, very, very 
high resolution and you have to take the sting out of it so that the clinician in the 10, 15, 20 minutes that he sits with a, with a patient is capable of transmitting the important information to the patient in a way that the patient then also can benefit from that and that you don't swamp the, uh, the, the clinician himself. So it needs an adaptation of systems in general. The, the issue is that uh, all the member states sort of are going at this, uh, this problem one by one. So there's no, there's no European uh, initiative to do this. It probably also would be far too complicated because healthcare systems are fragmented between countries, which is, which is only, only understandable and logical. Uh, the issue is that sometimes even within countries there is fragmentation of healthcare systems. So, so the, I think the, the first step is going to be that individual member states sort of tackle the problem and, and sort of um, come up with a solution how they are going to implement this in their particular countries and then afterwards compare sort of the, the hymn sheets with the, the guys next door to then sort of find consensus and see what have you done right or uh, what, what, where did things not, not quite work the way you wanted. And when you, when you look at this, you have the UK, which, uh, which essentially is, or Genome England in this case, which is running ahead with, with an initiative in this direction. And you see other countries that are sort of uh, looking at, at, uh, at England and saying, okay, if, how are you doing this exactly? And how could we potentially uh, benefit from what you've done so far and then sort of take that on for our own means. And that's, that's what's happening in Spain, Catalonia now. A couple of the autonomous communities are starting to look at that project and say, well, we should be doing this as well. How do we do it? How do we try to sort of immediately jump the mistakes that were made there and go to the solution rather than, than uh, starting from zero and, and, then, and then making all the mistakes that, that can be made to find that in the end the solution that they have is is maybe good enough or satisfies the needs. So, so I think it's a it's an issue of uh, of really uh, trying to align different countries with each other to get them to work together. They don't have to do exactly the same thing, but they have to implement it uh, in using similar mechanisms. And then there needs to be some form of uh, of uh, comparability of things because obviously there is a benefit to be garnered from the content that you are going to be picking up from all of the patients that you'll be analyzing. So you need to think in terms of of how can you sort of increase the value of, of that and th the only way you achieve that is sort of by having ways of comparing with with similar patients or similar treatments in different countries and putting that into a framework that is uh, that is secure enough for uh, for exchange of information without without sort of uh, without sort of really uh, compromising the, the the patient himself. So it should be driven very much by the national level, but harmonised, but in, but by having a, a framework at the European level that connects the different regions, which is done at the national level, but then connecting the different member states together to have this EU approach to this. And this is what you will see is lacking at the moment. Well, the thing is, it's it's lacking because the healthcare systems are not connected. You know, the healthcare systems, even sometimes within one country, are not connected to each other. So, so evidently, we 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 have to start building that level. I think the, there's a there's a huge need for 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 common language, common standards, common practices, common information that is picked up because that's really what what uh, what provides the value to future generations of uh, of citizens so all the knowledge that you pick up today is actually for the future so so that that's where uh, the volume the 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 collaboration bringing things together that's really where the the benefit comes in and can the eu do anything to support this or does it have to come from the from the national level and they agree um, between member states who are willing to collaborate on this and then form a, a collaborative network um, to start with. Would this be a way to work rather than a top-down approach where do you say you have to do this, this and this? Uh, which, which of these um, mechanisms would you say or a combination of both? Well, the, it's always a, it's always a uh, uh, forward and backwards. So essentially there's going to be contributions coming from the member states and there's going to be 
the the sort of the federated uh, system that that needs to sit above it. And it, what it needs is the interaction of the federated system and the and the member states. So member states understanding what they could do, what they could achieve, and the federation that sort of gives them the means to to move uh, to move their system forward. I think this really is is the important thing. So so it should not be a, a dictate by the EU that says this is how you need to do it. And then on the other hand, uh, it needs to be clear to the member states that, that here there is a lot of um, benefit to be gained from from having this implemented in your in your healthcare system. So you have to see that you really can do a lot better for your patients with a system like that than without a system like that. Gwendolyn Hudblud from the head of um, biobanking Janssen. Um, there's a lot of talk around personalised medicine at the EU level and national level. Um, what do you see um, coming from your um, area as the key um, challenges and barriers to facilitate um, an environment for personalised medicine? And, that, and by that I mean facilitating the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, which includes also both the therapeutics area and the diagnostics. Mm -hmm. um. I think we as a pharmaceutical company, um, we are a big enabler for all this personalized medicine. Uh, but uh, for us, the, it all starts with the qu good quality and good data of your samples. And we've been able to get an, uh, in, in Janssen to get a, a good global uh, system and process in place. So inter internally, we have the, the tools in place to enable all that. Uh, but it's still very difficult. Um, to get in lines, to get compliance with all the regulations, legislations, because we are a global organization. We are working with different countries within Europe. We are working outside of Europe. We work in Europe. We work in Asia. They all have the regulations. Uh, so it makes it very complex if you want to exchange samples, you want to set up collaborations. Um, that's for us, that always takes the most time before you get access to the samples. So for us, that is. Uh, very complex, it's always changing fast, and as a company it's very difficult to get compliance and to follow up with all of that. So these are key challenges and barriers. Uh, how, what are the key enablers? How can we tackle these challenges and barriers? And what can the EU level do, or national level do, um, to support this, mm -hmm. um, this development? Um, I think from the EU level, it should be very nice if we have a more standardized uh, legislation and that it's not different from one country to another. Uh, because, yeah, then we can work with standard contracts and now we always need to change the contracts. Uh, you need to get ethical committee approvals, which are very specific from country to a country. So for us, an, uh, a good standardized um, legislation on an EU level that is the same for all the countries, that should uh, for us be a good enabler. So an idea of re revised different legislation at the EU level. The European Clinical Trials Regulation was revised. Data protection is revised. And we're there now with the in vitro diagnostics and medical devices. Of course, these um, dossiers have to be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, are they enabler, a barrier, or, or a, a mixed match of both? Well, how do you see these legislative changes? Uh, I think it's already a good step forward, an enabler for all the things that we want to, to work on globally and within Europe. Um, but I think there's still uh, some work to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you st for example, we as um, here in Janssen in Belgium, we have the Belgium Biobank legislation, which is very strict, uh, very uh, complex to work with, to be compliant with. So for every time we, we uh, try to acquire samples in Belgium, it's, it's a very specific legislation and it's really uh, yeah, difficult to get it all uh, done in, in the Belgium environment.